Hey everybody, Jackie Lewis here. Welcome to this second season of Love Period. This season we're focusing our conversations on my new book, Fierce Love, A Bold Path to Ferocious Courage and Rule-Breaking Kindness That Can Heal the World. Each of my friends will be helping me to think about the themes in each chapter, nine practical practices that can help us love ourselves, love our posse, and then love the world and the healing. It all starts with you, and we're going to give you practical tips to make these practices a part of your life. Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's episode. It's inspired by Chapter 6 of my new book, Fierce Love. Think inclusively. They're your people, too. Today, my friend and partner in all things love, Brian McLaren, is coming by to talk with us. Brian knows, as well as anyone, how important it is to increase our tribe, that love calls us to think of all the people as our people. Brian McLaren, it is so good to spend some time with you today. How are you? I'm doing just great. Always a pleasure to be with you, my friend. You too. It's like, oh my God, I've had Brian McLaren sightings lately. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's good. It's good to be in person sometimes too, isn't it? That's right. It's fantastic. Brian, um, you've got a new book coming out. I do. What's the name of it? Uh, It's called Do I Stay Christian? And it comes Uh, out in May of 2022. I'm so excited about it. I've got a copy, as you know, and I'm reading it. And I'm thinking about how you are actually trying to get a lot of us who say we're Christian to migrate to something that's a little bit more something. Can I ask (laughs) you to fill in those blanks? (laughs) Sure. But uh, I have to say, when I read Fierce Love, uh, I felt, oh my gosh, uh, we've had such parallel journeys and we bumped into the same roadblocks and... And uh, it's uh, obviously we compare a lot of notes now, but when looking back over the last twenty plus years, we've been we've been on the same journey. Really amazing. Um, we really and, have. And, you know, I, I, so I have this uh, sort of primal spiritual experience in my past when I was a teenager, and it was this experience of being utterly loved, and this simultaneously the feeling that. Everything was loved, every mm. blade of grass, every star in the sky, every, you know, every grain of sand. Mm-hmm. And um, so this deep sense that what if God was anything, God was love and God was about mm-hmm. love. And mm-hmm. that anything that got in the way of that just wasn't quite right. Uh, it might have been, you know, an immature but best they could do Bronze Age attempt to to right. reach toward that, but right. uh, that we shouldn't be bound to those things because we're being drawn forward to this vision of love. So I I've had that literally since I was a teenager, mm-hmm. but there was so much in the religion version of Christianity that I inherited that didn't allow that. And reading your story, watching exactly that same thing unfold. Yeah, and and it encouraged me, actually, when I read Fierce Love, because I thought, gosh, there aren't just two of us out there, I'm sure. (laughs) There are hundreds and thousands. Or at least five. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Hopefully at least five. uh, Just at least five. (laughs) Maybe 12, (laughs) right? 12 would be really good. Be a good start. I, I I have really felt that also, friend, across time and we're we're just about the same age and we grew up in these different kinds of households in different parts of the country, right? In yeah. different kinds of brands of Christianity in a way. Yeah. You know, my parents weren't Southern Baptists, but they were black Baptists from the South. Yes. Right. And 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 for you and I to have been quickened, you know, yeah. awakened to yeah. something that is emerging, to go back yeah. to a word. I yeah. just am delighted in it. And it does make me have a lot of hope about the journey that we're all on. Uh, and maybe particularly boomers like us um, yeah. are, are, are having a spiritual awakening that can, uh, can help us draw the world to, this, to the, a new way to think of love, you know? Oh, my. Yes, yeah, so true. So true. And, of course, you and I are privileged to have friends in other faith traditions, too. And then yep. you see that there are, 
you know, Jews having a similar kind of awakening and Muslims yeah. having a similar awakening and Sikhs and Buddhists and Hindus and, and agnostics and atheists who, you know, maybe exactly. at, at one stage of their own journey were just so angry about stuff in religion that they just wanted to fight it and, and thought that the answer to everything was reason. Yeah. Uh, and I always remember this, the quote from Jane Goodall, one of my heroes in my life, who said, if you thought the age of reason was good, wait until you see the age of love. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so perfect. Yeah. I don't know that quote. You talk about having an experience as a teenager. I, I had that experience as a teenager, too, on a beach in Saugatuck, Michigan. Have you ever been yes. to Saugatuck, Michigan? Oh, I, I never God, have, so no. Oh, it's, it's now turned into, it was like campy camp camp, but the Presbyterians lost their minds and lost their money, and so now it's a beautiful, um, gay, mostly artsy community. It's fantastically oh, beautiful. So? But when we were little kids, we used to go to camp there, and maybe I was 14, and I just remember laying on the sand what, you know, and how you smooth the sand out so it's like body yeah. shaped, yeah. and looking up at the sky and imagining that I was moving the clouds, yes, and just feeling like God was so present, both yes. below me and above me, yes, and and a kind of confirmation that I was being called into that God, into the yes. presence or something, and that I was uh, really supposed to work to heal the world with love. And right, I just was like, okay, I hope this will become more plain, but it felt really clear. When you told that story in the book, uh, and it connected to kind of getting chewed out by a, a chaperone, <laughs> camp, counselor, a camp exactly. counselor the night yes. before, that was another point of reference. I, I remember getting chewed out by a guy on a retreat, on, huh. and, and, but he was right in the thing that he was challenging me on. Yeah. And I, I just think it's just another place where, so it, it could be nature. Um, it could yeah. be, you know, the sun, the clouds. It, by the way, when you tell the story, it, it makes me think, so you were lying on the beach and you knew it was the wind that was moving yeah. the clouds. Yes. But yes. there's a sense that that imagination is you saying, but you know what? The wind is part of me and I'm part of the wind. Yes, Exactly. Yeah. And and there's a yeah. deep theological insight in that and this deep breaking out of you know this sense that I'm this isolated individual uh, that has no connection to anything unless I so choose. Yeah, I mean that's that's part of what this whole process uh, opens us it's up about. to. Yeah. I'm going to tell that story uh, for our friends that are listening because it just cracked me up. And when I wrote it in the book, I thought of it as a minor character in a way. And my editor, Marnie, went, oh, my God, this is this is the thing right here. I was like, okay. Yeah. But yeah. it was uh, Lisa and her mother, Mrs. R. Um, we were at Sagatuck, and Lisa and I were the youngest kids on the trip. And we were like the skinny, underdeveloped chicks wishing we were curvy like, <laughs> like, like the juniors and seniors. <laughs> so... <laughs> So we had all been relatively good and we were being rewarded with, like, you can have some free time at the campfire. Like, okay. Well, my our older friends had brought, like, wine, cheap wine and weird whiskey and pot. <laughs> Presbyterian partiers. Like, exactly. All that stuff that teenagers need to do. And then they were beginning to turn on the slow music and, like, start slow dragging. So Lisa and I are like... I think it's time for us to go. We don't. This, this is not our scene, and we are so proud of ourselves, friends, that we get back to uh, to our cabin before curfew. Which is like, hey, look at us, we're so good. And we walk in, and Lisa's mom is grumpy and cranky, and we're like, what is wrong with her? Said, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are the other girls? Uh, well, they're. I think they're on their way. She chewed us out because we left them on the beach. She made us sit up all night on Lisa's bunk bed up top against the concrete wall. Y'all know how those camp things are. <laughs> because we because we left them behind. And she said it was our job, like, not to be on time and good, but to make sure that everybody got back safely. Brian, 
honestly, Marnie Cochran helped me to see inside that story mm. this theological resonance that our job as people of faith is to leave no one behind. Yes, yes, yes. Right? And so, oh my God, what happened, Brian? All of this like love come pouring out of the universe in the clouds, in the sky, uh, in that dream I had as a kid about you know walking yeah. around nature. And somehow we have, as religious people, made the the made our jobs yes. about who to leave out yes. and who to leave behind. What why, Brian? Oh my and how goodness. can and we why well, did we do that? I think it's one of the things about that story. I'm so glad you just told it because it almost works like a parable of what religion is. Because for a whole lot of people, religion is, I don't want to be in the company of those bad people because I might get in trouble and I want to leave them behind to get back and yeah. obey the rules. Exactly. <laughs> in one sense is very understandable, but mm -hmm. you're, you're um, a grumpy counselor uh, wanted you to see that's not the whole story. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, oh, my goodness. It, it, and in a sense, there are probably times, uh, I'm remembering that old rock and roll song, Mama Told Me Not to Come. That's not the way to have fun, son. <laughs> you know, so there probably are times to leave a party. But, yeah. but her reminder to you and the fact that it resonated so deeply in you and that it preceded a kind of spiritual sense of connection. Right. Uh, it, yeah, this was... Uh, an epiphany of sorts through a grumpy counselor. <laughs> through a grumpy counselor and, and, and a, sitting up all night on a bed. It, it is really true, Brian, and I, I want to be confessing to you, my friend, and to also to anyone who's listening, that I did not wake up one morning and be like, oh, look at God, everything is, belongs to God. You know, there was yeah. this ongoing revelation, God's yes. still speaking, love's still yeah. speaking. And, this, and the feeling when I was younger, Christian, I would, I just didn't have a, I didn't have a hermeneutic of suspicion. I didn't have a way to imagine something different. Yeah. So I, I did buy into, not, not anti-gay. I, I never had that. I, I didn't buy into women can't speak. I never had that. I didn't buy into, of course, racism because I'm black and that was stupid. I didn't buy into that. But I did have a little bit of sense that the Christians had the right story. Yeah. And, and we had the right God, and my job, I'm going to say before I was 18, this was my feeling as a yeah. young teenager, that my job, my missionary job, you know, I was being mentored yes. by some folks at church, my missionary job was to convert the world to Christianity. No kidding. Yeah. And, and that, that, and it didn't matter. Like, I wasn't mad at the Muslims and the Jews and the Buddhists, but my job was to help them to see the light, <laughs> to yeah. see the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? To God. Yeah. And I just am so sad, I think, in some way, for any of the moments. I was young, I inherited my parents' faith. But for any of the moments that I missed out on knowing mm. that God was multilingual mm. and that God spoke more than one religion yeah. and that God did not need my little butt converting people. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> except to convert them to love. I have sorrow about those younger years. Yeah. Can you relate to that? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, you know, I grew up super evangelical. And, you know, mm -hmm. my, my uh, paternal grandfather spent 40 years of his life in Africa, in mm -hmm. Angola. My dad grew up in a, a part of his childhood in Africa to convert heathen, you know, and, and mm -hmm. so on. And the truth is, I, I, I totally agree with you that our real job is to convert people to love. I actually think that's what Jesus was all about. Yes. Um, and that's what, when he originally said what people often call the Great Commission, um, uh, he, he was saying to people, go and help people live the way I've taught you to live, putting love right. first, having this yes. fierce love, letting this be. Right. That's what it was really supposed to be about. But... Uh, I grew up with that same sense. That the deepest division in my psyche was mm -hmm. not black, white, rich, poor, whatever. It was Christian, not non-Christian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and with that, I, I it took me <clears throat> literally. I mean, I think it was in the last twenty years that I began to see this. Uh, that Christian supremacy was something I thought was required of me. Oh wow! 
You know, to be a Christian means you have to believe your religion is supreme. And, and then I realized that when white Christians hold Christian supremacy, it becomes the camouflage for white supremacy. Oh, yes. And, Insight. Uh, and mm-hmm. of course, I, I think, you know, you and I both travel a good bit. And then around the world, you see that same thing works out in different areas. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so uh, this discovery that your camp counselor helps you see <laughs> that no, that the movement of God, if you're really a Christian and you believe that God moves into the world in Jesus, God moves into the world to the people partying around the campfire in solidarity with them and uh, yeah. to, to everyone with, with no exception. Amen. That is the, that is the whole Young young folks say that's a whole word. I don't know exactly what they mean by that, but that's what they say. <laughs> that's a whole word. You know, Brian, when I was a, a young, right out of seminary clergy, 30, 31, I lived in Trenton, and there had been Trenton was just a ghost town, right? The economic failure, industry moved out. The only business was government. Mm -hmm. And I had inherited this big old church building, and we started a new church inside it called Imani, which meant uh, faith in Swahili. And it was a few people from this church, a few people from that church in the Presbytery all came together to start this church with these young people, teenagers. And it was just wild and beautiful and amazing and wild. And the the police violence that was happening in Trenton then was not unlike what we've been experiencing seeing Mm -hmm. on uh, social media and iPhones these last few years. A young woman named Jenny Hightower was killed Mm -hmm. when her when her boyfriend was being arrested by the police. Like just like what did they do? The car rolled forward or something Mm -hmm. and just in a hail of bullets he badly injured, she killed. Mm -hmm. So the whole community um, the Black Baptists, the the Catholics, the you know, the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, the Muslims, all of us began to organize together around police violence. And yeah. what arose as allies are these young men called five percenters. I never heard of this until I got to Trenton. And it's like a if if there's Islam and there's black Muslims, then or and the nation of Islam, right? Then there's these five percenters who um, this guy named Clarence said, you know, we black people, we are not just in the image of God, we're God. We are each God. Mm. And therefore, we must protect our communities and this kind of thing. Now, that theology of I am God is mm. actually not far from where I am when I say each of us ho- holds the holy, each of us has the divine yeah. spark, right? Each of us uh, is a love shack, right? Because everywhere love is, God is, and we're love. But these guys were like, nope, we're gods. And they did not like white people. No white people. No. <laughs> they did not like white people. Because <laughs> they were, like, hurt, right? At the way American racism had Understandable. Yeah. smashed their souls, right? Totally yeah. understood. But Brian, when we put the call out for everyone to coalesce, those guys came. And they came with their names like Ra and God. And, you know, Mm. they came like young black angry men, angry at the violence in the city. And they came in solidarity. Mm. And when I moved out of Trenton, when I went back to grad school and left Trenton, they came to my multiracial church Mm. with the white people in it. And sat on the front pew with their beautiful wives and girlfriends in their white hijabs. And celebrated my ministry. Mm. I just, I just keep having experiences of God increasing my tribe. Right? Like, yes, I, yes, I don't agree yes. with those guys' theology. I don't. But like, they're yes. my people. They proved we proved we were each other's people. Yes. In that, um, in that way that Ubuntu implies that, you know, I am who I am because you are yes. who you are, and that yes. it isn't just the progressive Christians <laughs> yes. that are our people. Yes. Yes. But all these people are our people. How, how, how would it impact the way we live the world if we also thought religion, which my friend Brian McLaren reminded me means to rebind ourselves, mm-hmm. what would happen to the world if we thought 
faith, religion, spirituality was about increasing our tribe. Mm-hmm. Yes, instead of instead of splintering off to have an even exactly. more pure and elite yeah. tribe. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, that's such a, a powerful story. And uh, it reminds me of a mutual friend of ours in, in New York City, uh, Samir uh, yes. Salinovich. And in fact, I think Samir was the first person I ever heard use the term religious supremacy or Christian supremacy. Wow. Um, but Samir... Uh, uh, once gave me a sermon that he had preached. I guess he'd written it down. And I th- actually, I think it was in his book. Uh, it's really all about God. But um, uh, in this sermon, he preached to a church that thought they were one of the few and the chosen and the elite and the remnant yeah. and all those kinds of elites, you know, sectarian uh, identifiers. He told, He reminded them of the story of Moses when Moses is leading the the Hebrew children through the wilderness. Mm-hmm. And um, they do something really, really bad. And so God says to Moses, okay, Moses, I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to wipe them all out. Now, this is in the story, right? I don't think right. we take this story literally, but the story has a really fascinating meaning. Yeah. Uh, and, Mo- and God says, I'm going to destroy them all, and I'll make you and your descendants my chosen people. Mm-hmm. Yep. And and Moses says, "Are you kidding? Don't do that. That's a terrible <laughs> idea." And, right. and what's so interesting in the story, in a sense, uh, and again in the wisdom of storytelling, this doesn't work if you read the Bible literally. But if you let the Bible be literature rather than literal, mm, you know, very good, information, right? yeah. uh, it's it's as if God is showing up in Moses' disagreement with traditional notions of God. Yes, yes. And, yes. and so here, if you really are a chosen person, then you don't want to be a chosen person. You want everybody to be a chosen person. <laughs> All right. That'll preach. <laughs> it's yeah. true, right? Yeah. That sense of the, the, that chosenness narrative, and I don't mean, again, my Jewish friends, I don't mean any uh, insult there. But the chosenness narrative that occurs to many of us, only 144,000 of us are going to get saved or whatever all it is, right? <laughs> um, it, it really has been a dangerous narrative uh, in terms of manifest destiny. Our friend Mark yeah. Charles, yeah. Doctrine of Discovery, I'm yeah. supposed to, I get to, it's my yes. job to. Yes. I preached a really scary sermon on Sunday on Psalm 8. Mm. Mm. I love that text, and I like wrestling with it and kicking it around and trying to, like, let's say, redeem it. Mm. We're created a little less than God's 5% of nation, <laughs> a little mm. less than God, a little less than angels, but little, really it says a little less than Elohim, and to dominate or have dominion over, steward yeah. the world. And, and, the sense that, and, and, and humans have been crowned with glory and honor to do that. And so I was like, do my exegetical work saying, well, actually what, what's being said here is that we're, if God's our, su- our suzerain, we're God's viceroy's you know, posse, dudes, partners, yes. right? Stand-ins. Right. So then you love the world the way God loves the world. Not, yes. not with dominion, not with power, not with yes. exploitation of the earth, right? Not with white supremacy. You, you love the way yes. God loves. I was like, oh, my God. Then I could preach this sermon every Sunday, say it yes. again and again. Yes. If we are going to be people of faith, we have to think of our vocation yes. as being like God to the world. Yes. And yeah. the trouble is we make up this God who's just stank, right? That's yes. my theological word. Like, yeah. who's this God we made up that is just mean, <laughs> vindictive, willy-nilly, yeah. nefarious, horrible, and yeah. in our pocket and only on our team? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and, and this is this wonderful liberation. In fact, you're the first person I ever heard use this term, uh, that we need a grown-up God. Uh-huh. <laughs> Our mutual friend Richard Rohr often says, yeah. he says, the steps toward maturity are necessarily immature. Ooh. And so mm-hmm. that means that as, and, and you and I don't think we have the mature, fully formed, complete vision of God, but we can look back and see that our forefathers, they did the best they could. And they got an understanding that grew to a better understanding, that grew to a better understanding. And in that way, 
the Bible is, in a sense, giving us permission to let that process continue, to Amen. keep growing right. in our understanding. Right. I mean, Jesus makes that very point in one of the Gospels when he says, you know, you, there's a whole lot more I want to tell you guys, but you're not ready. The Spirit will guide you when, <laughs> when you're right. ready for it. And, and uh, so this is this beautiful process. And, and I remember in, uh, in Fierce Love, you say at one point that you had this sort of heretical period or, or when you just got yeah. to celebrate, you know. And, and, but here's the irony. It, it would be called heresy by certain people, but really it's the journey. It, it's, and of course, it's, it's a wandering journey often and we get a little off balance here or there. But it's the journey forward into a deeper connection with God, understanding of God, expression of God, as you say, so that we, in fact, I was just reading uh, uh, theologian Catherine uh, Tanner recently, and she said, the big question isn't whether we believe in God uh, or what we believe about God. The question is how we do God, how we embody God. Mm, Uh, I love that. Yeah. One text that really, like if somebody said, Jackie, pick one text. That's the only text. God is love. Mm. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Yes. Brian, what's your one text? Mm. (laughs) Uh, Maybe uh, I'll start at the very beginning. It was good. It was very good. good. (laughs) Good. I love that. I love that. Brian, what do you know for sure about love? It keeps getting harder. Mm. <laughs> uh, mm. You know, you, we start as l- little children. Probably the first person we love is our mother. Well, she's mm-hmm. giving us milk. She's keeping us warm. And, you know, and she has, she puts our well-being above her own. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it extends from there uh, to siblings who sometimes take our toys and sometimes mm-hmm. we feel rivals with. And then it extends to strangers and outsiders and outcasts and enemies and it just so i think the story of life in love is the story of ex, as you said expanding the circle mm-hmm. and and letting our love go f- more and more distant from our own self-interest oh it's so good i love that and if i say fierce love what comes up in you or what's evoked in you you know, I think a lot of people want love to be all warm and fuzzy uh, mm-hmm. and uh, pleasant and comforting. But when you love something, you're willing to put yourself in harm's way t- to protect the beloved. And so that applies to our neighbor, but I think it also applies to the earth when we love the mm-hmm. earth. Mm-hmm. and. So the fierceness of going to the streets and the fierceness of laying our bodies on the line and uh, fierceness uh, that you uh, experiences you and I have shared of of being able to you know being willing to let your hands be put in handcuffs so mm-hmm. you're because you tried to fiercely stand for to protect people and 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 the earth that you care about yeah the, there's that kind of fierceness that makes us willing to take risks. I'm so glad you're in the world, Brian, taking risks with me, being my brother, and working on, you know, increasing the beloved community together. It just means all the world to me, and I'm so grateful to you. I feel the same way, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for listening to this conversation. I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts on thinking inclusively. Make no mistake about it, the way our world is a hot mess right now is largely because we're too ensconced in our own tribes, too stuck in our own differences, too wedded to us versus them. Every day, you can make the practice of imagining your circle wider. Who are the people you don't know? Who are the people you don't understand? Imagine them as your people and be curious about their stories. Pick up a new magazine, read a different vantage point in the newspaper, maybe even turn your channel to that channel to watch the news and see if understanding other stories makes them feel more like kin than enemy.